Hi friends, this is Dr. Father Baker and I will be presenting Temporal Bone, Cure It, Master It. The temporal bone is considered to be a complex anatomical structure. It is perhaps related to the presence of multiple small subcentimeter structures which live in a very small compact area which makes it difficult for us to appreciate the three-dimensional orientation of these various structures and therefore their relationship to each other and therefore the underlying anatomy. To circumvent for that, what we've done typically on conventional CT images is to identify certain appearances, such as the ice cream cone appearance, wherein the ice cream is represented by the head of the malleus and body and short was the incus contribute to the cone. And likewise, the two line appearance of which the anterior of the two lines is formed by the manubrium of the malleus and the posterior of the two lines is formed by the long process of incus. And by doing so, we orient ourselves and then proceed to evaluate the other structures of the temporal bone. But such an approach has a steep learning curve. It's identifying these various appearances, these lines. However, advances in software technology, especially the utilization of 3D volume rendered surface shaded displays, has helped us assess for the morphological appearance of these individual structures and applying this we can assess the temporal bone more effectively and easily on our conventional CT images. So what I would like to do today is to help you conceptualize the three-dimensional orientation of these individual structures that constitute the temporal bone, their relationship to each other in space in a three-dimensional manner, and utilize that to help us understand the anatomy of the temporal bone when we look at our conventional CT images. So let us start our anatomical tour of the temporal bone by flying through the external auditory canal to enter into the tympanic cavity which houses the three ossicles namely malleus, incus and stapes. The malleus is shaped like a hammer. On its posterior surface it demonstrates a facet which articulates with the body of incus, the neck which provides attachment to the tensor tympani muscle and the manubrium which attaches to the tympanic membrane at a point known as the umbo. The incus is shaped like a premolar tooth. The body demonstrates a facet anteriorly to articulate with the head of the malleus, a short process which points posterior to the aditus and antrum, the long process which is directed medially and terminates as the lenticular process. The malleus and incus form a diarthrodial joint as shown here. By applying this volume rendered surface shaded image to conventional 2D CT images, we can now clearly see that what we see as ice cream cone appearance is clearly represented by the head of the malleus contributing to the ice cream and the body and short press vincus contributing to the cone. Likewise, the two lines of which the anterior of the two lines is formed by the manubrium of the malleus and the posterior of the two lines is formed by the long press of the incus. The stapes is shaped like a stirrup and demonstrates a head that articulates with the lenticular process of incus to crura, of which the anterior crus is thinner than the posterior crus, a foot plate that sits on the oval window attached to its margins by the annular ligament. Note that the color rendering for the stapes is different than that of the malleus incus because it has a different embryological origin and is more cartilaginous, less bony than the malleus and incus. These were all images that were created from conventional CT images using good 3D CT technique reconstructions. So having learned what these volume rendered images demonstrate, let us compare 
the 3D CT images, these are three millimeter thick reconstructed images and compare it to our conventional CT images. So here we see the two lines of which the anterior the two lines is formed by the manubrium of the malleus and the posterior of the two lines is formed by the long process of incus. We go further more cranially, we start seeing the stapes coming into view with the two crura. We go further cranially, we start seeing the tensor tympani muscle attaching to the neck of the malleus. And as we go further more cranially, we start seeing the ice cream cone appearance, which we have just described. Having looked at the ossicles, let us proceed to evaluate the inner ear. The inner ear is formed by the snail-shaped cochlea, the relatively oval appearing vestibule, which demonstrates the oval window and the round window, and the three semicircular canals. Notice that though there are three semicircular canals, there are only five openings of these canals into the vestibule because the posterior and superior semicircular canals share a common limb, which is the common cruise. The vestibule houses the membranous labyrinth and it demonstrates the various impressions including the elliptical recess for the utricle, the spherical recess for the saccule and the cochlear recess into which opens the cochlear active. These are all volume rendered, surface shaded displays cut appropriately demonstrating you all these recesses and it is like a true representation because look at the netter diagram. You're seeing exactly those impressions on the netter diagram. This is how good 3D reconstructions can be if we spend time and effort to get this kind of information. The cochlea is shaped like a snail and demonstrates two and a half to two to three quarter turns, gradually reducing in its diameter as it spirals towards the apex at a point known as the cupola. The cochlea demonstrates the osseous spiral lamina which divides the scala vestibuli from the scala tympani. The osseous spiral lamina in fact continues to the apex of the cochlea and remains the freestanding structure known as the hamulus allowing communication of the scala vestibuli and scala tympani at a point known as the helicotrema, which is important because it helps with the mechanism of hearing. Notice what happens, the sound waves come through, they are transmitted by the ossicles to the oval window, travel up the scala vestibuli and come down the scala tympani where the round window acts as a pressure relief diaphragm which is so important in the mechanism of hearing. So let us look at the uh, inner ear structures as they would apply to our conventional CT images. To the right are three millimeter thick reconstructed images, takes less than a fraction of a minute to recreate these, but it allows us to appreciate the anatomy better. This is obviously now the cochlea. This is the basal turn of cochlea, which is seen as a lucency on our conventional CT images. The impression produced is the promontory. Medially, along the posterior aspect of the petrous portion of the temporal bone and along the medial aspect of the mastoid temporal bone, you start seeing two lucencies. The medial one of which is the vestibular aqueduct and the lateral one of which is the posterior semicircular canal which can be clearly seen on our 3 mm thick 3D CT images. As we go further cranially, I always tell my residents fellows there's an easy way to identify the round window. How do I do that? I look at the basal turn of the cochlea, go posteriorly and laterally rounded lucency which is less than the cochlea and appears to be air containing will always be the round window.
Always identify the basal turn of cochlea, go posterior and laterally, rounded air containing lucency will be the round window. We go furthermore, cranially we start seeing the lateral semicircular canal coming into view. And then if we see furthermore anteriorly along the posterior wall of the internal auditory canal, you will see a curvilinear lucency which will be seen 100% of the time on our routine temporal bone images and that is the singular canal. It carries a branch of the inferior vestibular nerve as it heads the vestibule slash the posterior semicircular canal, never to be mistaken for a fracture. As we go further more cranially, we start seeing the oval-shaped vestibule, sort of deficient bone laterally is where the oval window will be over which sits the stapes foot plate in profiles so we never see it and then anterior to that is the clover leaf shaped cochlea with the bony modalis and then you have the openings for the cochlear nerve and the pinpoint opening for the inferior vestibular nerve if we go further more cranially we see the opening for the uh, facial nerve and we'll go over the various segments shortly and posteriorly you have the opening for the superior vestibular nerve. So we've looked at almost all the semicircular canals, the openings for the various nerves. We've not yet spoken about the superior semicircular canal but you can sort of see it here, the two limbs. And here they are, the two limbs of the superior semicircular canal. And then, of course, you have the subarcuate canal uh, that appears to the lucency, which courses through uh, in between them. Moving on to the facial nerve. The facial nerve has a very winding course through the temporal bone and perhaps contributes to the complex anatomy of the facial bone. However, as the surface shaded display uh, images will demonstrate to you, it is very easy to understand the course of the facial nerve through the temporal bone. So, here is the internal auditory canal. The facial nerve exits the internal auditory canal anteriorly and superiorly, housed within its own bony canal, a fallopian canal, heads to the tympanic portion of the temporal bone, makes a hairpin turn the anterior genu, courses along the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. Note, these are the ossicles lying below the lateral semicircular canal, above the oval window to reach the posterior wall of the tympanic cavity, makes a gentle turn the posterior genu and then heads vertically down as the mastoid segment through the mastoid portion of the temporal bone, killing off the cora tympani branch laterally and exiting through the stylomastoid foramen, which lies immediately posterior and lateral to the styloid process. And here is the uh, bony uh, or, or the uh, entire course of the facial nerve as uh, represented to you here by the volume rendered surface shaded display. Uh, again, to go over the anatomy, the facial nerve exits the internal auditory canal at its fundus anteriorly and superiorly, courses uh, through its own bony canal, the fallopian canal, reaches the tympanic cavity, makes a hairpin turn, anterior genu, courses along the medial wall of the tympanic cavity below the lateral semicircular canal above the oval window to reach the posterior wall of the tympanic cavity makes a gentle turn the posterior genu heads vertically down as the mastoid segment giving off the cora tympani branch laterally and exiting through the stylomastoid foramen which lies immediately posterior and lateral to the styloid process so now look and let us look at it as those lucencies that we see on our conventional CT images having understood its relationship or its surface shaded display reconstructions of the facial nerve.
exiting anteriorly and superiorly is the facial nerve as the labyrinthine segment. Why labyrinthine? Because it's uh, in relationship to the labyrinthine structures uh, through the fallopian canal, reaches the tympanic cavity, makes a hairpin turn, the anterior genu courses along the medial wall of the tympanic cavity as the tympanic segment below the lateral semicircular canal. This is shown in the coronal plane and above the oval window reaches the posterior wall of the tympanic cavity, makes a gentle turn, posterior genu, heads vertically down through the mastoid segment as the mastoid segment contained within the mastoid portional temporal bone, giving off the corotympany branch laterally. You can also see the nerve to the stipedius anteriorly and exits through the stylomastoid foramen, which lies immediately posterior and lateral to the styloid process. You know, as a resident, I was fascinated by the terms falciform, crest, bills, bar, and I could never see them on conventional CT images. But here is a volume rendered surface shaded display image looking from the porous acousticus into the fundus of the IC. And what do we see? A horizontal bridge of bone, the falciform crest, which divides the fundus into a smaller superior and a larger inferior portion. The smaller superior portion is further subdivided by a vertical bridge of bone, the pills bar. Anteriorly and superiorly, see the opening for the facial nerve. Anteriorly and inferiorly is the relatively larger opening for the cochlear nerve. Posteriorly and inferiorly lies the pinpoint opening of the inferior vestibular nerve. And posteriorly and superiorly is the opening for the superior vestibular nerve. It's fascinating for me to see that on the uh, volume rendered images, you can actually see the pinpoint opening of the inferior vestibular nerve and the large opening of the cochlear nerve as well. So, having understood um, the individual structures, their relationship, let us put everything together and start at the skull base at the level of the styloid process. Posterior and lateral to it lies the stylomastoid foramen. You can easily identify it because it lies immediately and posteriorly and lateral to the styloid process. And of course, you can distinguish it from the air containing mastoid air cells. You also see the carotid canal as in the jugular foramen. Uh, the jugular foramen has two parts, a pars nervosa, which is the smaller of the two parts, and the pars vascularis, which contains the jugular vein, as well as the 11th cranial nerve through the pars nervosa, courses the 9th and 10th cranial nerves. Going further, more cranially, you see the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. Laterally is the corotympany branch coming out and anteriorly is the nerve to the stapedius, which if you look for, you will see 100% of the time. Furthermore, cranially, you see the cochlear aqueduct should not be mistaken for the internal auditory canal. It's much smaller than the internal auditory canal and has a relatively more uh, sharper anterior course. And as you go further, more cranially, you start seeing the basal turn of the cochlea. Impression produced is the promontory. The lucencies come up along the posterior and medial aspect of the petrous portion of the master portion of the temporal bone, the medial one of which is the vestibular aqueduct, the lateral one of which is the posterior semicircular canal. Roughly, the vestibular aqueduct should be of the same caliber as that of the posterior semicircular canal. If it is more, you're going to suspect a large vestibular aqueduct syndrome. You go further, more cranially. I always tell my trainees if you have to identify the round window, follow the basal turn of the cochlea, immediately posterior and lateral to it. Rounded air containing lucency uh, will be the round window. Go further, more cranially, now you see the two lines of which the anterior of the two lines is formed by the manubrium of the malleus. 
posterior of the two lines is formed by the long prosthodynchus along the posterior wall of the tympanic cavity. You will see a bony projection, which is the pyramidal eminence, to which sometimes you can see the stapedius being attached, which will then go and attach to the neck of the uh, stapes. Again, uh, you know, it's too fine a muscle to be seen, and it's not even seen here. Uh, furthermore, cranially, we see the lateral semicircular canal coming into view. We see the singular canal carries a branch of the inferior vestibular nerve, should not be mistaken as a fracture. M laterally, within the tympanic cavity, you see the two crura of the stapes. You should see the two crura of the stapes every single time you look at temporal bone images. If you do not see it, either your technique is wrong or the stapes is absent. If the stape is absent, remember there are other abnormalities that will be present. More anteriorly, you see the canal for the tensor tympani muscle, the eustachian tube. Furthermore, cranially you go, you start seeing the oval shaped vestibule deficiency. More laterally will be the vestibule because the foot plate sits in a profile manner and is very cartilaginous, therefore not seen. You see the openings for the cochlear nerve, the inferior vestibular nerve, anterior to the oval shaped vestibule. You see the clover leaf shaped cochlea with the modalis. I'll tell you if you do not see the modalis, then you gotta look for one of the things is the vestibular aqueduct because it's literally 100% association between a large vestibular aqueduct syndrome and an absent modalis. You start seeing the tensor tympani muscle in the tympanic cavity attaching to the neck of the malleus. Furthermore, cranially you go, you see the various segments of the facial nerve. You see the ice cream cone appearance with the sharp press incus pointing to the auditor side antrum. And furthermore, cranially you start seeing the two crura of the superior semicircular, two uh, limbs of the superior semicircular canal, which always should be covered by bone, best seen in the coronal plane. If that bony Covering for the superior semicircular canal is absent, you will suspect the Tullius phenomena. Courses between these two limbs is the subarcuate canal, which is deficient in adults or small in caliber in adults, but is prominent in fetal life. In the coronal plane, starting anteriorly and going posteriorly, you see the canal for the tensor tympani muscle, the eustachian tube. The malleus comes into view as we go further more posteriorly, beautifully seen on those 3D CT images, which are three millimeter thick, allowing us to better appreciate our conventional CT images. You go further more posteriorly, you start seeing the manubrium of the malleus, the tensor tympani muscle attaching to the neck of the malleus. You also start seeing the external auditory canal, the bony projection inferiorly is the scutum, Space between the scutum and the ossicle will be the prosaic space, a space where cholesteatoma likes to grow. You see the incus coming into view again, not very well identified or seen on unconventional CT images, but can be beautifully seen uh, in our uh, 3D uh, CT images. We go further more posteriorly, we see the long press of incus, which is more medially oriented, to which is the lenticular press of incus, and you can just about see the stapes which go to the oval window. Now we'll go to the facial uh, nerve uh, uh, segments. So the best way for that is to start at the level of the cochlea. You can see the cochlea here in the 3D CT images. But the easy way on conventional CT images is that this looks to me like an inverted cobra hood. So once you see that, I know that I'm looking at the cochlea and immediately above that are the cobra eye appearance with the medial of the lucencies uh, contributed by the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve coursing through the fallopian canal. And the lateral one is the tympanic segment as it goes into the region of the anterior genu. You go further more posteriorly, you see the oval shaped vestibule. And of course, you have the two uh, semicircular canals going superiorly. The superior semicircular canal always covered by bone. If deficient, like I said, 2 d phenomena would be suspected. Laterally directed is the lateral semicircular canal, partially seen here, below which lies the tympanic segment, which is above the oval window.
And now we start seeing the vestibule more clearly. The lateral semicircular canal is also seen. The round window always lies below the oval window. One thing that I would like to tell you guys is that whenever you see the cochlea, if you see a canal inferiorly, that is the CC plane, C for cochlea, C for the carotid canal, easy to identify. So if you have a tubular lucency that projects at the level of the cochlea and the coronal plane into the tympanic cavity, you should suspect a aberrant carotid artery. Likewise, if you, as you go posteriorly, when you start seeing the vestibule, just as you have the CC plane, C for carotid, C for cochlea, we have the VV plane, V for vestibule and the tubular uh, or the rounded uh, lucency that is seen more inferiorly is the jugular foramen carrying the jugular vein. So it is the V V plane. So when you see the vestibule and you see uh, the, um, the, the jugular foramen projecting into the tympanic cavity, you can consider like a high riding jugular foramen. So remember the CC plane and the VV plane. Furthermore, posteriorly, you see the uh, facial nerve coursing through vertically uh, the mastoid portion of the temporal bone as a mastoid segment, giving off the corner tympanic branch laterally. So what I've tried to do here is to take a different approach to understanding the temporal bone anatomy, and that is by utilizing the surface shaded display volume rendered images of these individual structures that constitute the temporal bone uh, help you understand the relationship to each other by reconstructing these images in a three-dimensional manner and then applying that to our conventional CT images so that you can appreciate the anatomy much better and therefore understand the anatomy much better and then the temporal bone anatomy does not appear to be as complex. Again, go through that facial nerve winding course by just looking at those images and everything falls into place. I hope this has been useful for you. I thank you for your time and attention.